Hi, I'm Grace Kalamanik. And I'm Amy Lucenta. And we're going to talk with you today about the importance of turn and talks in mathematics classrooms. So Grace, there's so much information about uh, leading math discourse in classrooms and specifically about turn and talks. And I think they're important. I know you think they're important, but what would you say to a teacher? What, what's so great about them? So I think uh, turn and talks are one of the highest leverage discourse moves a teacher can use. Um, particularly when kids are talking, you get to hear their thinking and then you know like what choices you can make in the classroom about which ideas you want to bring forth to the whole class to think about and work on. And I sometimes find that I, when I'm working with kids, I often don't know what to do at a certain point. And the turn and talk becomes my go-to. I get them to turn and talk to each other about the mathematics, and that gives me time to listen in on what they're thinking and make a decision about what to do next. Because so much of good teaching uh, from what students are saying and helping them make sense is the, are these in the moment decisions that you have to make. And turn and talks provide teachers time and information to make ready decisions. I, I completely agree. And I think it's even more important and one of the reasons why we're hearing so much about facilitating mathematical discourse and turn and talks in particular is because if we want to focus on student thinking and reasoning, we need to allow that processing time we need to allow the development of ideas, and teachers need to be able to hear how kids are thinking about it, as you said, to make those complex decisions. It's a way to get inside their heads yeah. and hear what's going on. Amy, when you're first working with teachers around turn and talks, like what are the basics? 101 turn and talk, what do you have to know to set one up? I often suggest that when teachers first start with turn and talks that they start by having kids talk about mathematics. And that's not obvious, is that teachers sometimes want to teach a turn and talk by talking about a movie students saw over the weekend. And it's not as authentic as if it's about the mathematics. So that's like a non-starter. And kids are used to turn and talks in other content areas. So to remember that they've had this experience in other classes or content areas, and then to think about the norms that have to be in place for turn and talks. What is it that we're talking about? We're talking about the question that was asked and the mathematics in front of us and the kinds of things we're not talking about, what we did over the weekend, what we're doing after school, and super helpful to have some prompts mm -hmm. so that students have a prompt to first share their thinking, one student's thinking, and the other student has a prompt to listen and then share theirs, so that that um, two-way communication is ensured. It's sort of like a turn and talk and a turn and listen. <laughs> like one person's turning and talking and the other person is listening yes. carefully so that they can ask a clarifying question or add on or make a connection. Teachers have all different ways, I think, of you partner kids up, so before you send kids off to turn and talk, you want to make sure they're going to know who their partner is. And sometimes they know who their partner is already because it's a class structure, and sometimes it's not. So you've got to quickly look around the room and make sure when everybody turns and talks that there isn't one or two students sort of on their own without a partner to talk to, whether it's your shoulder partner or your cross the table partner or whatever. Grace, what's your favorite thing about Turn and Talks? My favorite thing about Turn and Talk is it's my go-to strategy when I don't know what to do in the classroom as a teacher. So like when I'm confused about what kids are saying or what my next move is, I have them turn and talk, continue to talk so I can listen in and make a decision about what to do. So it helps you make a decision in the moment. It's yeah. interesting, my, one of my favorite things is <laughs> it's a great move when everybody wants to talk at once because it allows them all to talk. And it's also a great move when no one has anything to say because they need to like think it through and talk it through with each other before they're ready to talk in the full group. Yeah, exactly. And if you've got a lot of English language learners in your classroom, or kids who have to work out 
how they're going to say something. It gives them an opportunity to practice the language before they share in the whole class, and that gives them confidence. So now I want us to come back together, and we're going to discuss the strategies that we did to solve it with our partners. Okay, what I did is I did circles. I made eight equal parts, and I shaded two of them in. I made four equal parts, shaded one of them in. Because one plus one equals two, and four plus four equals eight. Um, the ones that you put there, are they all equivalent fractions? Yes. What I'm looking for is when students are partners, I really look to have, you know, the discourse between each other. If they're having a conversation, not just one partner telling another partner what to do. Really trying to figure out the problem. Those sentence starters, that accountable talk, taking ownership of their learning. Say, I agree, I disagree, or maybe even asking each other questions to see how they could else they could solve that problem. I noticed too with one partnership today is when one partnership is just using a model and so one other partner in the group said, let's try it a different way, see if we can use a number line to help solve a problem and that's just great because they're taking ownership and figuring out there's another way that they could solve the problems.